such a pleasure to be here today on this very important event. Um, and I'm going to just start by just giving a little bit of background on these Castle Awards. So um, Castle really has a, established these awards to encourage high professional standards and recognize outstanding achievements in the field of social and emotional learning. And Castle created uh, the awards to honor the legacy of two individuals. And today we're going to be focusing on Mary Utney O'Brien. Who, um, and also she was a former Castle executive director and key leader in the SEL field. And you'll learn more um, later about the webinar tomorrow with jo that honors Joseph Sins. So um, one of um, Castle's strategic goals is to support, uh, encourage leaders in SEL policy and practice. And so the Castle Board of Directors established the Mary Utney O'Brien Award for Excellence in Expanding the Evidence-Based Practice of Social and Emotional Learning. Um, this really, this this award really honors the legacy of Mary Utney O'Brien. As I said, she's a former Castle Executive Director and we lost her way too early in April of 2010. Um, and this award really um, embodies what Mary was all about, was really about um, highlighting priorities that advance evidence-based practice in states and school districts. Mary was a tenacious and uh, tireless advocate for social and emotional learning and really was there at the very beginning, um, starting the movement and played such a critical role in both Castle and in the larger field of SEL. Um, so I'd like to just read a quote from Mary. It was what, an article that she wrote along with others. So. And I just want to read this to you because it so much embodies what Mary's thinking was about. So imagine schools where children feel safe, valued, confident, and challenged, where they have the social, emotional, and academic skills to succeed, where the environment is safe and supportive, and where parents are fully engaged. And imagine that this is not just the exception in the elite or small school, but in every school and for all children. Imagine that integration of social and emotional skills as a part of education at every level from preschool to high school. Imagine it as part of a district, state, and federal policies. This is our dream for 21st century education, and it is happening now through rigorous experimental and action research and partnerships with schools. Throughout the country, we have seen the impact of social and emotional learning, not only on children's learning and development, but also on school functioning. More and more schools are adopting social and emotional learning as an overarching philosophy and framework for school improvement and children's optimal development. So, um, and you can go to the next slide now. Um, and so one of the things that is so important today, so this was just Mary, you know, writing this years ago um, when SEL was really just starting to percolate up. And what we have today is really her dream come true, this imagining it. And we're going to hear to, today from two leaders in the field, the award winners, who both embody um, Mary's um, ideas and practice of advancing the social emotional learning practice and policy. And I'm going to just give a short bio for each of them, and then we're going to begin with, um, with Dr. Uh, Shelley Berman. Um, so Dr. Shelley Berman is currently the superintendent of the Andover Public Schools in Massachusetts. Over a 28 year career as a superintendent, he's implemented systemic SEL programs in each of the four districts he has led. Dr. Berman has also provided national leadership in multiple organizations and champion um, that champion SEL. And he's authored numerous articles and books on SEL topics that you'll be able to access as well. He was a member of the Council of Distinguished Educators of the National Commission on Social, Emotional, and Academic Development and served as the primary author of the commission's report on um, SEAD practice. So we're very excited for uh, Dr. Berman to join us today. And also, um, we have another uh, outstanding award winner here, By Byron Sanders. And Byron Sanders is a president and CEO of Big Thought, as well as a a uh, committed advocate for education, economic development, and creating equitable communities throughout Dallas, Texas. Um, Sand Sanders explores innovative ways to narrow the opportunity gap for children by connecting people and organizations to prepare young people in under-resourced uh, communities for tomorrow's cr creative economy through quality in school, after school and community partnership experiences. Um, I'm just so thrilled to be here with these two award winners today. I know we have um, we were going to learn a lot and have a really uh, engaging presentation. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Berman right now. 
Well, thank you, Kim. <clears throat> and I want to thank everybody who has joined this webinar. Um, it's really quite a statement that uh, there are probably about 1,700 people who have joined us. And uh, that kind of commitment and that kind of interest in social emotional learning is very gratifying for, for me and I'm sure for Castle and for the vision that Mary Etne O'Brien had for uh, social emotional learning. So welcome. I hope in the next 20 minutes, which is my portion of this, uh, this webinar, I'll be able to share with you some of the insights that I've had uh, over that 28 years. Uh, and actually, I began as a superintendent at the age of 12. So just so you know, I'm not that old. But anyway, the, um, but share with you the insights that of what goes into uh, success and in, in implementation of a uh, social emotional learning program that's effective and that's sustainable. Uh, so where I want to begin and move to the next slide, where I want to begin is that there's a core principle that motivates me and that motivates, I think, the work that uh, many of us do is the understanding that the social curriculum is as important as the academic curriculum. That in fact, social emotional learning can't be divorced from the academic curriculum. Learning is social. Learning is emotional. And uh, the one of the outstanding uh, elements of the report and findings of the report that the National Commission did was the, that to affirm that link and to really affirm that the work we need to do is uh, not only academic but is social and that we need to be as conscious of the way we structure the social environment as we do the academic curriculum. So how do we do that? And I, I want to um, move to the next slide and just talk about some of the the first step is actually setting the context. And for me as a superintendent and for other administrators, it is about looking at your mission, your vision, your strategic plan, and seeing how all of that embeds the uh, concepts of social emotional learning so that teachers and other administrators feel empowered to move forward and to do this work. Uh, in Andover's mission, as, it, as we've articulated the mission here, but also in the other three districts I've served as superintendent, we uh, embedded social emotional learning. In this mission, it says we will provide every student with opportunities and support too, and you can see some of the elements that are academic, but it ends with the, the, some of the most critical, which is to demonstrate cultural awareness and appreciation of self, empathy towards others, a sense of responsibility and a commitment to civic engagement, which really encompasses the full range of social emotional development. We've also embedded this in our strategic plan. And uh, next slide. The, uh, and our theory of action. And actually our theory of action is fourfold. And we see that we can make a difference for students and we can advance academic achievement and student learning by focusing on creating caring and culturally responsive classrooms, providing rigorous curriculum, inclusive instruction and progress monitoring so that we are uh, looking at our progress, not only in academics, but also in social emotional development as well. We've also embedded it in sort of the vision of the district. And I think you can see behind me the poster that's on your screen now. And it, it was a collective effort of our entire staff we framed the question, we won't stop until all students. And we asked people, what what would you say? Well, how would you fill in that sentence? We won't stop until all students. And they literally came up with these elements. But one of the most critical and the one we started with was we won't stop until all students feel safe, connected, confident, valued, and honored for their uniqueness. So very much at the at the start of our work, we begin with social emotional learning. But what does this mean in practice? So let's move to the next slide. And, and what we want from our students is really to cultivate a sense of empathy and to develop their social skills. And we have framed it in sort of three larger goals in terms of empathy. One is to help children become sensitive observers of the feeling states of others, uh, to help them understand the causes of those feelings and then help them find appropriate ways to respond to others' feelings and to resolve differences. You can move to the next slide. Uh, and in terms of practice, we implement those, we strive to implement those three concepts. First of all, in teaching empathy and social skills directly, and I'll talk more about that in a moment, 
but we also want to build that into the very nature of the classroom, the very nature of the school, and build a sense of community where students feel connected and interrelated with each other. We also want to build it into the curriculum so that the curriculum reflects what we are trying to teach socially and emotionally. And then we want to give students a, an opportunity to exhibit those skills in one of the most effective ways that we have found for students to exhibit compassion and uh, other positive social skills and pro-social skills is through service learning and providing more of a comprehensive service learning program. Now we've laid this out in a, in a sequential way, in fact, and uh, tried to take a systemic approach. So for example, in Andover, for, in terms of social emotional learning instruction, we use a second step and open circle curriculum in elementary in through middle school. In terms of curricular integration, we focus a great deal on our pedagogy in terms of collaborative learning. And then in terms of our content, we've looked at our literature and the readings that students do, the uh, coursework that they do, and made sure that they reflect uh, cultural awareness and reflect the social emotional learning that we want students to achieve. That ends up at the high school level, actually with uh, some work we have been doing with Facing History in Ourselves and a Facing History in Ourselves course, which looks at prejudice and intolerance and uh, its impact on uh, others and on society. In terms of building community, we use a program called Responsive Classroom at the elementary level. Uh, go back, I'm sorry. <laughs> Didn't, uh, in terms of building community, uh, we use a program called Responsive Classroom, but also uh, we empower students and give them voice through student councils. We have a program at the middle school called Where Everybody Belongs, which is uh, a program where eighth graders mentor sixth graders throughout the entire year. And at the high school, we have an advisory block that we call H Block. And then we have service learning that begins really at the, even at kindergarten and moves all the way through the high school. And now the next slide, thank you. The, but I wanted to spend more time on community because I think we know a great deal about teaching social skills. We've seen the curricula and there are many curricula out that, that are uh, very effective in teaching social skills, but we have to live those skills in the classroom. And what does that mean? Well, first of all, I define community as students' experience of being valued, influential contributors to a group that is dedicated to the learning and well-being of all its members. And there's some two critical questions that I think we need to ask ourselves. Next slide. And one is, to what degree do I, as an individual student asking him or herself, what to what degree do I, as an individual, get to make my presence felt in helping things function here? And then secondly, how am I empowered to be a player, an influencer, someone who matters as opposed to a silent cipher whose existence makes no observable difference in the flow of life in the room? So in, in fact, these are key questions and key concepts because creating community, and if you can move to the next slide, creating community actually has two key elements. One is engagement, and it reflects how well students are engaged in the uh, classroom, and also connection, how well they feel connected and safe and known and valued. Next slide. Now, there are many practices that uh, build community and uh, help us focus on community. Uh, as I said, we use some responsive classroom practices. One is morning meeting, which is a gathering in the morning in a circle. Uh, where it's a daily routine that builds community, it creates a positive climate, uh, it reinforces social skills. Uh, there's a whole variety of strategies for morning meetings that are highly effective. But there are a whole variety of other strategies as well. Next slide. Which are not only morning meetings, but closing meetings. And both of that is a reflection at the end of the day when you bring the community together and you say, you know, what, ask a simple question like, what is, what is one way that you saw someone help another today? What is one insight that you had that you didn't have at the beginning of the day? And go, again, go around the circle. It's a way to build community, build relationships, build reflective uh, capacity. Another is class meetings or open circle meetings, uh, which are really problem solving meetings. While well, morning meetings and closing meetings really serve to build relationships and, and uh, build the connection, 
uh, class meetings and open circle meetings and advisory meetings, as a matter of fact, uh, serve to build that sense of engagement and voice. Uh, buddy programs are a wonderful way to build community where you have, uh, whether we have eighth graders uh, buddying with sixth graders or we have fifth graders buddying with second graders and a variety of grades meet and do work together. Uh, there are home side activities, which comes out of a program called Caring School Communities, which are activities that can be done at home with parents, that, and then children bring that information into school and share who they are. They share about their culture, they share about their background, but it engages parents, not just in an ac academic way, but in a, a way that uh, brings their involvement in, in a way that's safe and uh, so that the family feels integrated into the classroom. Uh, there's school-wide community building activities as well as service learning activities. And then, frankly, one of the things that we have to think very carefully about is how we uh, pursue discipline. And uh, I've worked with strategies of developmental discipline, which is looking at what is developmentally appropriate, how do students learn from the, the issue or the mistake that they've made, uh, and restorative practices, which is really about how we restore relationships and make relationships whole. Next slide. There, I think it's also important to see that, that equity, community, and social emotional learning tie deeply together. And that uh, we can't just see this as a way that we're teaching the social skills of the dominant culture, that we have to really enter the room acknowledging all the cultures, all the backgrounds that are in present in the room and in our schools. So, you know, social emotional learning, the way we pursue that and the way we build community builds that sense of belonging to a caring and inclusive community, not an exclusive community. It's a, a community that looks to bring people together and have each other acknowledge uh, each other. Uh, it's social emotional learning also can't be done to fix students or, or in a sense, uh, promote the dominant culture values and, and pose that some values are, are, or some cultures are more right than other cultures. That in fact, our goal is to be culturally inclusive and create identity safe classrooms and uh, schools and have those conversations, important conversations about race and identity in the classroom. We also have to take an asset-based approach uh, that affirms students' strengths, their cultural identities, and their lived experience that they bring to the classroom, and find ways that we help students enter the classroom, feel good about where they're from and their experiences, and that those experiences are valued. And finally, the, I, it is critically important from an equity lens that we also look at uh, uh, whether students are developing an ethical base, whether they are acquiring a moral compass and helping them think about their own social responsibility and be able to make ethically grounded decisions. Next slide. So how do we do that? Well, there are a number of ways that we can promote equity through social emotional learning. One is to adopt equity policies that uh, acknowledge the value that differences in student backgrounds play in promoting learning and development. Uh, we can provide instructional materials and professional development that incorporate cultural, responsi cultural responsiveness. We can help teachers address implicit biases. Uh, we can implement strategies like universal design and multi-tiered systems of support that really ensure differentiation uh, and are based on student needs. Uh, of course, this requires professional development in equity, diversity, cultural responsiveness, um, and it also requires that we provide consistent messaging that developing students' skills requires culturally responsive and inclusive instructional practices. Next slide. So there's some lessons that I've learned and I wanna bring this to a close and sharing some of the lessons over these, these years as a superintendent. You know, first of all, that social emotional learning <clears throat> requires the consistent planning that is required of the academic curriculum. There is actually no difference. We need to look at scope and sequence just the way we look at scope and, scope and sequence of the academic curriculum. <clears throat> Second, we need to be intentional 
about embedding this in the academic curriculum and look at where there's intersections and where we can highlight in our literature, in our, uh, in our work with um, social studies and science, ways that we can draw out uh, the social-emotional uh, learning that <clears throat> is embedded in the academic curriculum. Excuse me. <clears throat> social-emotional learning also requires modeling by adults and living those skills in the classroom. It, we have to actually model that. We have to reflect it in, in the way we work with our children, but in the way we structure our classrooms so that they're working with each other, consciously building community, consciously building that sense of connection between children and uh, between ourselves and children. And that building community requires cultural authenticity that it is the presence of our cultures, it is the presence of our individual identities that really allows children to feel safe, to feel known, and to feel accepted. Uh, service learning deepens the meaningfulness of our social-emotional learning work when students uh, go out into the world or out into their school and serve others, uh, whether that's community service or service learning, they end up uh, feeling not only uh, more a sense of power in themselves to influence change and to, to improve the world around them, but they also demonstrate the kind of compassion, empathy, and social skills that they've been learning. As I said, the methods of discipline either foster or undermine social-emotional learning goals. We have to look carefully on whether we want compliance and are seeking compliance, or we want autonomy and individuals who can think about their practices and think about their responsibility and their social responsibility. Another learning is that an essential ingredient of effective SEL is high quality professional development. Uh, we don't walk into this work knowing all, all that we need to know. Uh, we have our own learning curves. Many years ago, I started and helped start an organization called Educators for Social Responsibility that looked at conflict resolution. And one of the first things that I learned was that although I thought I was good at conflict resolution, I had much to learn. And it's okay to say that we have more to learn and we have uh, ways that we can improve our own skills. And the deeper levels of professional development, uh, the better in terms of facilitating that. And finally, I think one of the things that's absolutely critical is administrative vision and leadership, so that our leaders give our uh, those who are um, in the school, whether it's parents or students or teachers, the discretion and the support they need. Next slide. There are a number of resources. A Nation at Hope was the National Commission report. There's uh, there are uh, documents on practice. Uh, documents on research, documents on policy. I would really encourage you to um, pick those up on the web. I know that we've posted that link uh, in the chat, and you're welcome to uh, download those. They're all free, uh, and uh, they're very valuable resources for expanding this work. Next slide. And then I also want to say that, uh, frankly, the, the core of my thinking is that when you create a caring school community, it actually gives students the vision of the way the world could be. We are modeling what we want in the world. And so the impact we can have is really extraordinary in terms of bringing a vision, a sense of connection, knowing the possibilities that we can be a community, that we can work together, that we can support each other, uh, and that we can resolve our conflicts positively and move from uh, debate and uh, the, the kinds of differences that we experience to dialogue and common ground. Um, I have a website uh, that has a lot of resources on it. Um, it's posted on the, in the chat as well. You're uh, welcome to access any of those resources and I encourage you to, to take the next steps um, this is an important, this is very important work, and I appreciate all that you are doing. And now I'm going to pass it on. I talked about the school end of this, and I know that uh, Byron Sanders is going to talk about after school work as well. So, Byron. 
All right, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Berman, and a phenomenal job. I'm co-signing so much of what you shared earlier on, and you'll see how it builds. But first, with gratitude, um, I want to uh, first give thanks to Castle for, um, for the work that you all have done for years and for creating this space and a platform to share um, uh, some of the great work that's happening across the country in social and emotional learning. The second thing I want to do is uh, in gratitude is, is to acknowledge that this recognition uh, that I'm standing here as a recipient of today uh, is a team award. Uh, Big Thought as an organization has been doing this work for a very long time. And I, I want to acknowledge some names very quickly. Uh, Gigi Antoni, our longtime CEO, um, and in our work with our older youth and youth who have been justice involved, uh, Lisa Schmidt as an innovator uh, who's now passed the baton to Sasha Davis, who's carrying this work forward in Creative Solutions, uh, and the amazing teaching artists who have been part of uh, building and transferring these, these powerful life-changing skills, one of which I want to acknowledge who's recently uh, departed. His name was Rage Tench. Uh, one of the most powerful poets um, you will ever have heard in your life. Um, he uh, uh, recently passed away and uh, his legacy lives on through this work. Uh, gratitude to Greg McPherson um, and, and uh, the entire social emotional learning team uh, within Big Thought Institute. Uh, Christy, Latricia, Amy, Deborah, Pamela, Allison, Christina. I hope I'm not missing any. Uh, and then also to our school district partner, Dallas Independent School District has been an amazing partner for uh, this work over the years. Dr. Uh, Michael Hinojosa, a phenomenal leader who really doesn't just nod, but but hard co-signs the work that, that we've been able to do together. And Juan Ivaldo Espino, who's worked so closely with us in the most recent years, as we try and build what does SEL look like in our community uh, here in Dallas. So with that gratitude, we can go ahead and dive into it. So social emotional learning has power. Uh, so often uh, when, when SEL is introduced to our communities, to our schools, to our partners, uh, sometimes it, it has a tendency to be uh, couched as a uh, means of behavior management. Uh, alone. And, and quite frankly, it does it a disservice because what social emotional learning truly is, is power. And in a place where we're trying to create an equitable community, when we're trying to create equitable systems, uh, that requires a transfer of power. And one of the things that that we do when we teach explicit social emotional learning skills, uh, you're putting in young people's hands, the equipment for them to exert their influence, be the one in control of their world, how they react in scenarios, um, the one to be able to be empowered to go out and build the right kinds of relationships, uh, and, and, and also the ability for them to um, put to use the different assets that allow us to create a more just and equitable society around us. That's power, y'all. And that's the work that we're doing as well. So um, next slide. So I, I say this not because um, it's just academic, but because I'm a beneficiary. Uh, I am a, a child who, I, I grew up as a child who, who benefited greatly from out of school time experiences. And as a young man who grew up in a household where there was domestic violence, where um, there was trauma uh, that I had to fight through, the place that I loved so much that was escape and that was a lifesaver was uh, non-traditional learning spaces out of school time, whether it was um, a track or uh, odyssey of the mind or theater or, or, or anything else, math Olympiad. I was going to these spaces because I got a place to breathe. I got a place to just be myself. I got a place to experience joy. And you know what would have made it even better is if in those moments, there was a contiguous alignment between the um, school day and the after school with explicit social emotional learning practices. I got so much there and thank God for my mother who uh, had the wherewithal and the foresight 
to know that these were going to be really important parts of my life. Um, but because I went to those spaces, it allowed me to plug in with mentors, people who would pour into me and where I could steal uh, moments of joy that would allow me to thrive and to continue to persist. Uh, and we know that there are so many of our young people who, who need that uh, for a lot of different reasons and in a lot of different ways. Uh, they need these spaces and it is incumbent upon us to create the kinds of systems so that both during the day just as Dr. Um, um, just as Shelley just shared with us there, um, during the day having explicit embedded social emotional learning, that should continue on into the hours after the traditional school day. And so with that said, that's why Big Thought is in this work. Next slide. And um, what we have been doing since we started in 1987, uh, is we have been trying to build the uh, the assets of young people. We've been trying to close the opportunity gap by leaning in um, and providing experiences that build the creative muscle, build social emotional well-being, and invested in and created space for youth voice and agency. And uh, we initially started that as a Dallas chapter uh, of an organization that was bringing the arts into the schools. But over the years, we grew and our scope and scale uh, grew. And so now today, we're an organization that over the course of a academic year and a non-COVID year, our touch point is a total of about 150,000 youth between the programs that we operate ourselves and the organizations and partners that we support. 150,000 youth in the Dallas area, the North Texas area, and we're so grateful uh, to, to be able to be a part of all of that. And so as we became more sophisticated in our programming, um, it shows up in a number of different ways. It shows up with youth who are just as involved. It shows up in our consulting with other organizations and institutions. Uh, we serve as a backbone agency for complex ecosystems, youth-focused organizations. And in each of these places, each of these lines, social and emotional learning is a critical foundation of how we show up and do our work. And so I wanted to talk about uh, a very special project that we're in the middle of right now that, that uh, explicitly works toward the area that I was just mentioning uh, just a moment ago. So next slide. Um, first, before I, I dive deeper into that, I wanna articulate what we came to an articulation of um, about two years ago when we did our strategic plan, we named our North Star. Uh, we want to create a world where all youth in marginalized communities are equipped to imagine and create their best lives and world. So for us, when we say marginalized communities, we're talking about race and economics. Um, we are here as an organization uh, on an anti-racist journey to close the opportunity gap between kids of color and their white uh, peers who are in middle income and upper income scenarios. Uh, and so when we have uh, that clarity of mind, we understand that social emotional learning is part of one of those things that will equip young people to go out and create that world uh, for them and the world around them. So next slide, and we'll go into a specific initiative that we've been able to be um, uh, fortunate to be involved in. 2017, Big Thought and our long-term partner, Dallas Independent School District, uh, which is one of the top 15 largest schools in the, in the school districts in the nation, we developed a proposal uh, to be part of a national grant uh, through the Wallace Foundation for a longitudinal study focused on developing and implementing uh, aligned social and emotional learning strategy, both for the school, in the school, and after school. So along with local partners, Dallas After School, Dallas Parks and Rec, Dallas became one of the six cities in this study um, funded by Wallace Foundation. Uh, it's called uh, Paselli. Uh, we pronounce the P in this one. Um, but uh, the whole idea is that the Wallace Foundation is not only providing philanthropic support, but also, also expert consultation. And so um, in partnership with CASEL, uh, the Weikert Center and more, we got to work. And from day one, we worked together 
establishing a leadership and multi-level feedback structures that aligned on the annual goals. <clears throat> when the district selected Sanford Harmony as the foundation for their SEO work during the daytime, what we did at Big Thought was we worked together to develop a correlating pacing guide for out-of-school time programs that aligned with the out-of-school time readings, uh, the projects, activities uh, to the in-school themes and experiences. And so what we wanted to do was create this contiguous fluid experience so that youth who were participating in the traditional school day, once they got to after school, there wasn't a jarring um, uh, separation of the norms, culture, practices, and expectations that were being built over the course of the day. And y'all, it has been a beautiful, beautiful uh, experience. So we encourage cross-training uh, with out-of-school time educators being trained and integrated into the house model um, and in-school educators being uh, trained in playworks. In and out of school educators also together participated in learning walks uh, to see implementation at other campuses both during and after the school day. This whole notion was we wanted to to break that that uh, artificial wall that happens at three o'clock uh, for many of our young people and the joy has been our youth have benefited significantly i wish i could share with you all of the data that we're starting to see come out of it but um, um per the terms of the of the research we will be able to share that once there's a um, um more comprehensive report that the RAND Corporation is sharing with us. But what I can tell you is that culture is benefiting, uh, the youth are benefiting, um, and the, the adults in the building are benefiting just as much as everyone involved. It is an entire all-in family affair. And this work, I think, is indicative of the utopian uh, example that we're all trying to push toward where uh, a young person has a 360 degree uh, network of support that helps reinforce the social emotional skills and um, um, and asset results that come from um, being able to be explicit about embedding these in experiences. Um, we again are so grateful for that amazing partnership with Dallas Independent School District and it would not be possible without them. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So as we kind of broaden the net on talking about why social and emotional learning is so important and how it shows up in our work, um, we also know that that it's it's it, social and emotional learning has to move beyond the choir. So it can't just be the school district that embeds social and emotional learning in their practices. We also see SEL as a power, uh, uh, a powerful tool in uplifting community. So. One of the things that that big partner with nonprofit organizations um, and and other entities to go out and do work in community, um, anywhere from the Dallas Public Library to the uh, mom and pop uh, community rec centers here in the city, uh, Big Thought over the years has partnered with um, and actually our current set of partnerships is over 700 organizations that include corporations, sites, churches, like I said, libraries, rec centers, uh, roaming, traveling, uh, teaching artists. This is a beautiful and profound network where we're making distinct investments in how to bring social and emotional learning uh, explicitly out to our partners so that the youth that are in their programs can benefit uh, significantly, so that there's family engagement uh, that takes place anchored on the same principles of social and emotional learning. Um, it's not good enough for us to just do it within Big Thought's own programs, and which is why we've incorporated it into all of our knowledge sharing uh, capabilities and expanding throughout the networks uh, that we operate. Um, so I'll go ahead and move on to the next one as well. And I wanted to get into a, a little bit more of a distinct uh, way that um, social emotional learning practice shows up uh, in, in some programs and in this particular program that I'm going to highlight is also a means for us to start to think about what systems um, need to fundamentally change if we're truly activating what social emotional learning looks like uh, in embedding them beyond just our education uh, spaces 
And so uh, with a trauma-informed approach, many of you all are, are likely familiar with this notion, but, but um, I'll just go into a little bit of our conversation or a little bit of a discussion on, on ACEs and why this work <clears throat> has had such profound results. Um, um, adverse childhood experiences, as you all know, uh, have a, uh, a significant role to play in uh, the outcomes for young people. Um, and quite frankly, the health of our community. There's this notion of the pair of ACEs uh, being one of the biggest predictors of outcomes um, for, a, uh, for a community and certainly within specific demographics, pair of ACEs, adverse community environments uh, that are created oftentimes by concentrated poverty produce adverse childhood experiences. Um, we also know that some youth are at greater risk of experiencing ACEs uh, and certainly experiencing ACEs without uh, buffers that would need to be in place in order to uh, mitigate the impact of those adverse childhood experiences. One of the primary um, uh, student populations that I think we need to really highlight in this day and age in particular are youth who have been justice involved. Um, if you go to the next slide, we have a program that we do called Creative Solutions. We've been doing this for about 25, over 25 years now. I think we just finished our 27th year. Uh, it's been in partnership with the Dallas County Juvenile Services uh, Department. And what we have learned is that uh, if you embed a, um, a trauma-informed approach on top of, in our instance, an arts as workforce model, so the youth who come to us are working artists over the course of the summer, you can have some tremendous results in a young person's life. Now, the, work, the young people that we're dealing with are on probation. And the uh, sad truth of the matter is that on average, uh, these young people come to us with about 14 distinct traumas that have happened over the course of their lives. If you're familiar with ACEs research, you, knows, you know that six categories of ACEs um, can yield a 20 year less life expectancy. 14 distinct traumas happening over the course of a life, some of which don't even show up in the 10 um, studied uh, uh, list of uh, ACEs from the um, uh, landmark study in 97, 98. We know that there's a lot of trauma that these young people are working through. So what happens when you give them an experience, seven weeks, uh, intensive, and I would say probably the correlation to a uh, in-school uh, MTSS uh, would be either a tier two or tier three response. Um, when we create this kind of experience, these youth make some amazing gains over the course of that period of time, just seven weeks. Uh, we measure their social and emotional development using this uh, social skills improvement system from Pearson. And what we have seen is that the young people first find their own voice. They find their own value. And in doing so, going through a creative experience where they have to either produce a play or a visual uh, arts gallery work, by the end of those seven weeks, these young people make some tremendous life-altering uh, revelations about themselves and how they show up in the world ahead. If you go to the next slide, and the proof is in the pudding. Um, a typical program um, for youth who get access to some degree of program um, who've been on probation, you usually see about 38% recidivism rate. That is the most, uh, the likelihood for them to reoffend and and go back into the system. The creative solution seven-year average is seven percent. Our last year, um, um, uh, last year of data is only four percent recidivism rate, and that <clears throat> is the lowest in the county. It's one of the lowest in the state of Texas, uh, and the reason why is because we prioritize this trauma-informed, um, uh, focused toward healing approach. I'll give you an example of how it's embedded in the experience of creating. So we have this uh, uh, experience where a, a young person will make a face mask, a plaster mask of themselves. Uh, but in order to do it, um, you actually have to be very still. And in being still, you focus on your breathing. And we coach them and are intentional on leading them through that guided exercise. 
You also can't do it yourself. So your community, your cohort of young people, many of whom have to break through that wall of trust, they now have to rely on people that they've only recently met in order to do this. But the young people are encouraged to check in on their partners, check in on their uh, cohort mate, on their fellow artists, and they're building a connection. And as they go through and they finally finish the mask, you have a literal picture of your face. And then you paint it, you decorate it, and you call yourself beautiful. And you can see they're making a work of art, but that work of art has an explicit set of SEL-based practices that allow them to, one, check in with themselves, see the value within themselves, but then also learn how to articulate that and share that out amongst uh, their, their, um, their class. And we have a series of those kinds of experiences. And because of that, that's why those um, recidivism rates are so low. And these are the kinds of things that we need to start to embed in not just our schools, but also in our justice systems. You have a criminal justice solution right here. And if we can start to embed and to grow social emotional learning in systems beyond um, uh, the healthcare sector and beyond, even beyond the education sector, if we embrace and engage people who are outside of the traditional learning spaces and start to work collaboratively between the schools and out of school time providers, these are the kinds of results that we can start to spread throughout our communities, throughout the country. And you can start to create those systems that transfer and, and, and really infuse people's um, uh, capacity to leverage their own power. We already have greatness inside of us. Our young people have greatness inside of us. Social emotional learning creates the conditions for that greatness to shine through. Next slide. And so when we say our path forward, where do we go from here? Uh, I would, I would, I wish I could tell you all of the different things, the ways that we're teeing ourselves up to use more social emotional learning. But I could tell you that there are school models that we're now in the middle of designing that embed creativity and SEL as the core definition of what it looks like to go through the school day. We need to start moving social emotional learning from beyond the icing to being actually the cake. Um, so if we can continue to press ourselves there, change policy to align with it and allow our educators the space and place and dollars in order to pick up these new practices, that's how we're going to fundamentally change things. And I think that's how we equip our uh, youth to go out and build the kind of equitable and just society that we all deserve. Uh, so with that said, I will shut it down and turn it over. Thank you all so very much. And we look forward to uh, talking with you and answering your questions. Thank you, Byron. That was wonderful. And um, I wish we had more time to hear about everything you're doing at Big Thought. And same with you, Shelley. I know there's so much more going on at Andover and we just got the tip of the iceberg, but um, it's been really inspirational and informative to hear from both of you. So we do have some time for some questions. So let's go ahead and um, dive into those. So a burning question for both of you, really, but we'll start with you, Shelley, is um, how have you adapted your community building efforts um, during these distance learning times? That's a really great question. Um, you know, we, we continue to do some of the same things that we do in the classroom. So, for example, yeah, I, I have to say we are fortunate. This is, um, we are, we have distributed uh, Chromebooks to all our students. We have, uh, uh, we're completely online uh, for those who need it. Uh, we are uh, in a hybrid situation so that students are in for two days a week. Uh, so about 20% of our students are remote and 80% are in for two days a week. But when we are remote, we continue to do things. For example, at the elementary level, our teachers still do morning meetings and closing meetings. Uh, with all their students uh, on a uh, video conference so that we still they still have a connection with each other. Um, and when we're doing remote learning with all our students remote, they still have morning and closing meetings. Um, we still have class meetings at times when there's an issue and, and something to talk about around that, uh, around whether it's how we are using technology or how able students are to use technology or whether it's something that's come up around assignments. 
At the middle school level, we still have uh, more of a, uh, the web program. We are doing that virtually so that students connect with each other virtually. And at the high school, we've actually continued our advisory program online so that we are connecting. Now, some of it is happening asynchronously. Uh, so I would say that, you know, in, in some situations, it is very possible to continue that kind of uh, building of social emotional learning and community within the context of this online environment. The, the one thing that's very important though, and I just want to affirm this, is that I, I think the key is the value we put in relationships. And our teachers really value relationships. Um, our teachers, when we weren't able, when we first went out in March, I mean, they were literally going to students' homes and delivering packets. Um, there was outreach and phone calls when we couldn't reach a student. Uh, the, the, we, the connection that our teachers tried to create with our students was vital to them remaining connected. Uh, and a whole variety of strategies. We, we actually, our teachers took a bus tour um, it's sort of a cheering bus tour through the community, uh, through their communities, just to rally the students. And the students were on the on the sidewalks, you know, cheering as the teachers went by. Just little ways that we can say we care. So that's that, and and obviously you embedded in academics in the same way you're you're teaching academics. So if it's a you're reading a novel, you just don't ask about character and plot and setting and writer's craft, you ask, how did that, that individual deal with the conflict? How did that individual build a relationship where, that sustained over time? Or what happened in that conflict that really uh, broke that relationship or disturbed that relationship? So you know, th there's a way of looking at all the work we do and still continuing, even in a virtual format. Those are such great examples that the, the English literature example is just the perfect way of SEL is not this separate thing. It's just it's woven into those conversations that we're having all the time. And yes, the little things we do during these distance learning times are so important, more important than ever, but um, they make such a big difference for our for our kiddos. Um, Byron folks asked about what Big Thought is doing in terms of distance learning with your after school programs and supporting kids. Um, how has that looked for you all? No, it's a great question. We have had to be very agile. I'll start there. Uh, we're having to exhibit these these same principles that we're trying to be uh, sharing with our families and with our youth. Um, so we've actually had multiple pathways of delivering um, uh, programs and services and connecting with our families um, and the young people uh, on campuses, uh, as I'm sure many people are are doing across the country, you have youth who are both remote and you have youth who are there in person. And so we have begun in our beginning in waves, um, our, our on-campus socially distant after school programming. Um, we actually had an opportunity to practice that earlier in the, uh, uh, during the pandemic, when we had our first spike, uh, we actually put together an emergency child care center for um, um, frontline workers in the medical industry. We have a medical district where we have multiple hospitals that are there together. And uh, we put together a childcare facility for um, uh, people who were uh, working at the uh, Children's Medical Center, UT Southwestern Hospital here in Dallas, and then, uh, and then Parkland. And so uh, from 6 a.m. to 7 o'clock p.m., we did a socially distant in-person um, out of school time model that was essentially a camp when the schools were closed. And in building up those skills, we learned how to do socially distant um, uh, programming in a way that still allowed for human connection when we couldn't be as connected as we typically would. Uh, it looks very different. And it certainly is more expensive because your ratios are down. Your, your square footage has to change now. Uh, but we still, so we're delivering person socially distant after school programming uh, in, in delivering SEL um, explicit instruction during that. The other, is, uh, the other thing that we've done is we've um, actually started remote um, um, out of school time, if you will. Uh, the whole definition of out of school time has had to change uh, right now because it, so there are a lot of people who are just not in a school building, but they're still in school. So um, we have remote learning 
where young people have logged in um, to to uh, interact with our social emotional uh, learning specialists uh, and with our out of school time providers. And so um, we've been working with our teaching artists to help them convert their experiences to virtual uh, as well. And we provided for that. The last way that we've worked is uh, somewhat of a hybrid where we send out uh, these creative kits uh, to our families. And so whether they, they either come to the school and picking them up or we're mailing them out to families, and in these kits are guided instructions that have both synchronous and asynchronous learning opportunities. Um, um, and some of them actually facilitate interaction between family and the youth themselves. But SEL is a critical component uh, even in the design of those kits. So those are the three different ways that we've primarily uh, been, been reaching out with digital content, real-time content, and then the in-between. Thank you for sharing all that. And as you said at the beginning, I think we've all um, had many opportunities to put our SEL skills of resilience in particular and adaptability into play um, over the past several months. And certainly it sounds like um, Big Thought has done great work to continue to serve the community and, and help everybody through these challenging times. Um, a quick question for you, Byron. Folks were just wondering if Big Thought works outside of the Dallas area. What's, what is the footprint there? So uh, we have historically only been really within the Dallas area for our explicit programming. We have actually um, um, done capacity building and um, uh, consulting all over the actual world. We've even gone to South Korea and done some of this work. Uh, but we're also now starting to uh, uh, expand our, our horizons on where our, our our actual programming shows up. So for the first time, we've brought creative solutions to a new county uh, this past summer. Uh, we're looking at others as well, and um, and we're we're open to expansion in the ways that make sense uh, for our strategy. Uh, we also have a division of our work called Big Thought Institute, and Big Thought Institute is essentially our consulting arm, and we're doing a number of projects all over the country uh, with both public and private uh, partners and clients too. Before we finish, I just want to also extend a thanks. I think Byron did this as well, but maybe speaking for both of us, thanks to Castle for your leadership and Castle's leadership in making all of this happen. It's very humbling to get this award, but to know that it's, it's in the spirit of many people who've done this and to thank all the people who've joined us and to encourage them to take up the banner and take up the baton and, and keep it going. Yeah, thank you for that, Shelley. Amen.